Welcome, everybody. I'm delighted you're here. Welcome to the people that are, that are watching us online. Uh, I'm excited about this. Uh, it's particularly timely. Um, I was going to say it's timely uh, for policy reasons, because what a trend in trade seems to be toward more plurilateral agreements and more bilateral agreements, uh, which means, by definition, rules of origin become very important, because you have to decide what qualifies for the benefits inside the zone, whatever that is, or what, and what doesn't. And to the extent we get more of those agreements, you're going to see more rules of origin. Uh, and uh, I think it's becoming, it's, and what we've seen in the USMCA case, which is our case study, is, I don't, is these things become instruments of, of policy not simply instruments of setting up rules that are, that are neutral. They become a means of achieving policy objectives. So I think we're likely to see more of this, uh, which suggests that our, I think our findings are particularly timely. I was also, also going to say that it, it, it's, it was timely in another way, which was uh, uh, we're going to talk, among other things, uh, about the, the costs as well as the benefits of, of the case study. But you know the president uh, has been threatening he was going to was threatening until earlier today to close the border, uh, and the Center for Automotive Research uh, reported today that if he did that, uh, it would cost uh, the automobile industry seventy million dollars per hour, which uh, is over five billion a week. And I'm thinking, you know, this uh, this is small cheese compared to that. Um, but apparently uh, now he's not going to do that. Um, the Mexicans have a one-year reprieve, and then he's going to put on automobile tariffs, which were also going to cost uh, the industry a lot of money. So there's a lot going on, uh, and a lot of other things going on in the industry itself that are not directly related to rules of origin that we'll also be discussing. So I'm glad you could come. I'm not going to uh, preempt uh, Jack and get into what we said. I'm going to leave that for him. But I do want to tell you uh, how we're going to uh, run the thing. In just a minute, I'm going to turn the podium over to uh, Michelle O'Neill of uh, Alcoa, uh, who, which, whose foundation has funded this study, for which we're very grateful. Uh, when she's uh, finished, uh, Jack Caperell, our research fellow, will come up and present uh, the study, and he's got some slides for you. Then after that, uh, he'll take one of these seats, and then we have a very distinguished panel that I'll introduce at the time that's going to come up uh, from the industry itself. Uh, to talk about the report and, and comment on it, and we'll have, a, I think, a good discussion. At that point, uh, when that's finished, we'll turn to you all for Q&A. And I need to tell you, you all have an index card on your chair, and we're going to use the index card written method for questions this time around. So if you have a question, write it down, uh, and our trusty interns, Jonas and Madeline, will come around and you know, pick it up and uh, bring them up to me, and we'll do it. we'll do it that way. That way, you don't have to wait for the roving mic or figure out where you're going to stand or anything. Just uh, write them down, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. And then uh, after that, uh, we're going to have a, uh, uh, a dessert reception right outside. So the reward for sitting through all this is some uh, wonderful little nibblies um, afterwards. So with that, let me introduce you to uh, Michelle O'Neill, who is an old friend of, of mine. We were colleagues together at the Commerce Department. Uh, she was down the hall in a different bureau, but uh, one of the people that there that I came to appreciate, when you're in the government, you know, one of the things you immediately do is, is, is try to uh, figure out who actually can do things and, and get them done. Uh, and she's one of those people. And, and when you find those people, you cherish them, and you never let them go because they're efficient. And the entire, you know, outside the Commerce Department, in the, in, during my entire time in the Clinton administration, I found three people who could do that. Uh, one at OMB, one at the Defense Department, and, and one somewhere else. And you want to, uh, uh, you want to cherish those. And within the building, uh, Michelle was one of those. She is currently Senior Vice President of Global Government Affairs and Sustainability and a member of the executive team for the Alcoa Corporation. Previously, she was the Deputy Undersecretary of Commerce for International Trade uh, for seven years, and in 2012, where she oversaw the daily operations of, of ITA, the International Trade Administration. Uh, she received the nation's highest civil service honor, the Presidential Distinguished Rank Award, in 2012. She has a master's from the LBJ School at the University of Texas and a bachelor's degree from Sweetbriar. So Michelle, if you'll come in and start us off, then we'll go on to the presentation of the report.
Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Bill. I'm glad that um, you recall uh, now recall fondly our time together at the Commerce Department. I, I do recall so there's a little bit of tension between the export control portfolio and the export promotion portfolio. So I'm glad. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> That's one way to characterize it, Bill. So thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you. And it's, it's, I'm delighted to be here. And um, it's always so nice to come to these events and see so many familiar faces and people that I've had the pleasure of working with over the years. So uh, first, uh, thank you, Bill, and the rest of the CSIS team for the hard work to, um, in, to, in preparing this report and the event today. I'd also like to thank uh, the members of the panel for taking times out of their, time out of their schedule to participate in today's discussion. Um, as part of my government affairs and sustainability portfolio at Alcoa, I oversee the Alcoa Foundation. The Foundation's mission is to contribute to environmental excellence, economic success, and social responsibility around the globe. I think we can all agree that the USMCA has the potential to impact all three of those pillars across North America, so the Foundation was particularly uh, delighted to sponsor the study. Determining origin, as Bill um, said before, is one of the foundations of a free trade agreement, and the rules of origin tell you which products benefit from the agreement and which do not. The growing number of bilateral and plurilateral trade agreements make it increasingly complicated to manage supply chains, where being able to distinguish between items inside and those outside of the agreement is important, not just to one agreement, but potential, potentially several overlapping agreements. This report is particularly timely as well, as it includes a case study on the auto rules of origin in the USMCA. It provides useful insights into the shifting rules of origin requirements and the challenges and opportunities those rules propose, uh, pose, which today's speakers will discuss in more detail. The report also highlights the ways in which rules of origin are being used in increasingly creative ways to drive desired economic and social outcomes. I encourage you all to read the report uh, when you have a chance, and I look forward to, dis to today's discussion. And with that, I will turn it over to Jack. Thank you all. So. Hi, I'm Jack Caperell, the uh, Associate Fellow with the Schulter in International Business. Thank you all for being here. This is a lot of interest in a topic as weedy as rules of origin. Um, so I appreciate you all taking the time. Before I jump in uh, to the guts of the presentation, I'll quickly lay out our core findings and then uh, go into more detail. So the, the, the first main conclusion is the USMCA rules of origin are extremely complex, by far the most complicated uh, rules of origin in any trade agreement, and are an attempt uh, by the administration to shape or influence an extremely complex industry. That is the auto industry. Second is that the rules will generate uh, some short-term costs for auto companies, although you know those costs will vary by company and uh, vehicle model, but should also generate a uh, long-term investment in the industry in the United States and in North America overall. Uh, the third takeaway is that uh, less efficient supply chains that could be spurred by the rules could impact the global competitiveness of the North American auto industry uh, through a variety of, of uh, different ways, and that these changes come at a critical time when companies are looking to invest in new technologies at the heart of the nascent mobility uh, revolution. So with that, it might be good to take a step back and go over what rules of origin are and what their purpose is. So the purpose of a free trade agreement, obviously, is to boost trade and investment among the participating countries by lowering tariffs. Uh, and laying out rules for economic activities between the parties. So uh, making sure the benefits of a given trade agreement are concentrated to its participants, however, is a, is a tricky business, um, right? So reducing trade barriers among the FTA partners does not guarantee that the goods produced in the region are the ones that receive preferential treatment. So for example, an FTA member with a low external tariff uh, for a particular product could import that product, then send it again, to its FTA partner at an even lower tariff, even if the product's ultimate destination uh, has a higher external tariff, right? That obviously undermines the purpose of the free trade agreement. And so in a bid to prevent that scenario from unfolding, trade negotiators have come up with the great idea of rules of origin, uh, which are a means to determine where good uh, is from and a method to incentivize local content in trade and manufacturing among FTA partners. So 
Uh, simple products require simple uh, rules. Oranges picked in Florida or Washington cranberries are obviously wholly obtained in the United States, and so they face very little rules of origin. Uh, scrutiny. Complex products, on the other hand, uh, require more complex rules. So in some cases, such as automobiles, a certain percent of a product must be made within a region to be considered originating and qualify for trade preferences. And then there are a slew of other, uh, you know, how do you calculate that, uh, et cetera, that goes into, into that um, determination. So CSIS undertook a project to review the impact uh, that rules of origin have on supply chains. As was just mentioned, we used auto rules of origin in USMCA as a case study and uh, serves as a, well as a case study for a few reasons. First is uh, it showcases an evolution in rules of origin from the original NAFTA, so we had something to compare to, um, and is also essentially an explicit means to influence supply chains. Uh, as I previously mentioned, the industry is complex, so there's a lot to look at. Vehicles are made of 30,000 parts sourced from hundreds of suppliers. Uh, and third, there are domestic and international players. Um, so companies import and export cars and parts uh, within and beyond the NAFTA region, and all of that is involved. Also, uh, obviously, it's an extremely timely issue if you uh, follow the news. So a uh, brief, really big picture view of the North American auto industry. So in the NAFTA region, the United States still dominates automobile production, although there have been a steady stream of uh, investments in final assembly and parts production plants. In Mexico in recent years, uh, sales in the region peaked around 17 million in 2017, and it would seem as though some companies are restructuring and expectation of declining demand in North America and the U.S. in particular. That's not to say uh, that the auto industry is about to collapse. It's just that people are buying less cars, although they're still buying a lot of cars. And it's also important to note that the peak and the changing rules of origin, as I mentioned, come at a time of large change for the industry. Um, so there's a general shift in mobility towards electrification, automation, connectivity, shareability, all of which have potential to reshape um, the industry. So NAFTA has helped shape the auto supply chain in North America. It's led to significant interdependence within the industry. I think everybody has heard uh, the phrase, you know, you don't buy a U.S. car or a Mexican car, you buy a North American car, or the phrase, you know, we build it together in North America. It's certainly true. Vehicles produced in the U.S. contain 40 to 50 percent imported content, most of which comes from our NAFTA partners. The average vehicle produced in Mexico contains 20 to 30 percent U.S. Canadian content. And by comparison, vehicles produced outside the NAFTA region contain only 3.5 percent North American content. So there is a large regional factor um, at play there. Um, so. Um, Missing a page here. Excuse me. When it comes to um, production in North America, the other thing to note is that ex expanded production um, in Mexico is not necessarily zero sum with U.S. production or Canadian production, um, in large part driven by uh, the, the the content. Uh, statistic. When you look at the industry as a whole, it's important to note that while NAFTA made the auto industry in North America more competitive, the NAFTA rules of origin themselves um, were not a primary factor when North American auto companies uh, were making supply chain decisions. Um, and the second important thing to broadly note before we get further into this is that, you know, final assembly plants where the car is put together um, does not by itself confer origin, right? That's only a fraction of the supply chain. There are thousands of parts suppliers that exist in each of the NAFTA countries, and those make up the bulk of the supply chain and the guts of the supply chain. So uh, that all raises the question, if, if not rules of origin in NAFTA, what um, were the primary drivers of supply chain? So at a basic level, comparative advantages matter, right? That includes the size and skill of your workforce, uh, relative difference in wages, and other kind of structural factors. Um, Another thing that was clear through our research was that parts companies and vehicles assembl assemblers place a huge amount of importance on um, trust and reliability in their partners to deliver parts and components on time of the right quantity and of the expected quality. Um, there's a general preference in the industry to build where you sell, um, to cut down on, on time to move your, your product to the final destination and cost there, although there are general exceptions to this rule. and. Um, also, the most pressing uh, issues facing the industry currently um, through our research are the, the Section 232 tariffs on steel and aluminum, the absence of skilled labor 
in the U.S. and um, now more currently, obviously, the issue with the border and the ratcheting up of uh, tensions with Mexico over uh, car tariffs, uh, which Bill briefly alluded to. Um, so going from NAFTA to USMCA, so USMCA, like I mentioned, if implemented, will, will contain the most strict and complex automotive rules of origin in any trade agreement. So the original NAFTA uh, requires that, 62 point, uh, that vehicles meet a 62.5% regional value content threshold. That's what RVC stands for in all of these bullet points. And that just means that the vehicle, 62.5% of the vehicle, uh, the, of the vehicle's content has to come from within the NAFTA region. Um, and then for parts in NAFTA, it's a 60% regional value threshold. Um, there is also rules regarding uh, tariff shift um, for certain parts that would confer origin. So basically that means if you import uh, steel, for example, from a country outside of the NAFTA region and then stamp it into another part like a door, you could argue that, the, or you could claim that the door is then originating, right? Um, USMCA, on the other hand, uh, contains three fundamental rules, all of which must be met in order for a vehicle to be considered uh, originating and qualify for tariff-free trade within the region. So first, there's an overall vehicle uh, regional value content of 75%, so it's a substantial increase from 62.5%. Uh, second, there are different uh, regional value content thresholds for different types of parts, uh, which is a extra layer of, of complexity because NAFTA just had the flat 60% threshold. And then third, there is a novel uh, new rule about uh, labor, which uh, states that in order for a vehicle to qualify for USMCA preferences, at least 40% uh, or 45%, depending on whether it's a car or a truck, of the vehicle's content must be made by workers who make at least $16 an hour. So this is really a backdoor way to encourage manufacturing in the US and Canada. Um, you can get credit for the labor rule through research and development and uh, assembly work as long as the workers meet the $16 an hour threshold. So it's really like a, uh, like a 25 to 30% um, $16 an hour manufacturing requirement. But it is uh, an extremely novel innovation in terms of rules of origin. Um, so USMCA also does away with NAFTA's tracing scheme, and this is where it gets like even more in the weeds. Um, as well as the concept of deemed originating, um, which would have implications throughout the supply chain. So tracing as a concept was a means to prevent manufacturers um, from including, was a means to track non-NAFTA parts throughout the entire supply chain. So if you had part of an engine that was imported uh, from outside the NAFTA region and that part was on the tracing list, that part would never be counted towards uh, would never be counted as um, part of the vehicle's overall content, even if the engine met the 60% rule. Um, so NAFTA had a list of items that had to be traced um, all the way through and was uh, kind of a pain for the industry. Um, and there was also this rule that if items weren't on the tracing lift that list, they would be deemed originating. So you would automatically assume that they had NAFTA origin. And so NAFTA negotiated uh, in the 90s, left off a bunch of critical components that are, will feature prominently in the future of vehicles that you wouldn't have to trace and would therefore deem as originating. So that includes sensors, LIDAR, radar, chipsets, things that will be at the core of the vehicle of the future. And, and so all of those items now will be factored in uh, to USMCA. And then finally, I, I skipped over steel and aluminum. This is an important one. Uh, 70% of a vehicle's steel and aluminum will have to come from the NAFTA region as well, or uh, under USMCA. So under NAFTA, um, steel and aluminum was not traced and was also parts that used a lot of steel and aluminum were subject to tariff shift rules. So uh, some companies uh, had elected to import steel and aluminum from abroad, kind of stamp it, change it into a part, and that would be the, the tariff shift that would then lead the part to qualify. Uh, USMCA essentially closes that loophole. Um, so you'll, you'll likely see more uh, North American steel and aluminum it being used in vehicles. Um, the steel and aluminum requirement is a day one requirement, right? 
So there's no transition period for automakers to meet that rule. The uh, other requirements all have three-year phase-ins uh, with some exceptions. Um, so there's a little bit of space to work with. Um, let's see. So the implications. So I think it's important to keep in mind that when the Trump administration was renegotiating NAFTA, they had a fundamental goal, uh, which was to increase automobile and parts production in the US. And if you kind of track the, the negotiating history, which we won't get into, it's abundantly clear that that was their objective uh, from day one based on the proposals that they were putting on, on the table. So um, through our research, we found a level of general agreement regarding the overall impact of USMCA on the automotive industry. I would stress that there are definitely companies that are better situated to comply with the rules and they will have to do very little to meet the new requirements while other companies are less off. And so it's tough to make a, a general claim about this. The impact of the new rules also doesn't vary just by company to company, but also, I mean, model to model, part to part, supplier to supplier. Um, but one of the costs that we found that I think everybody in the in every stakeholder will have to deal with are administrative costs, right? So just making sure that your ducks are in a row and that you'll meet the new rules. Like I said, for a lot of companies, the original NAFTA rule of origin was not something that they paid a lot of attention to because it just wasn't very difficult to meet. And if you're building a vehicle in North America, more likely than not, you're already set up to meet the new rules. The complexity um, and the added layers of the USMCA rules of origin will require folks to take a second look at, at their supply chains. And that, if you're a large auto company, uh, either assembling or producing parts is not free, right? That's, an, it, that's expensive. Um, and um, the rules, we also found that the rules may lock in an environment in which cars and parts built in the US and North America capture a larger share of the North American market um, right, obviously that makes sense because more of your content has to come from North America. Um, but those costs in the short term could eat into companies' ability to make a, a, a investment now on uh, research and technology in the future. That's not to say that U.S. automotive companies are going to be miles and miles and miles behind the rest of the world, but that these are companies and, you know, when you spend money somewhere, you have to look for ways to save money elsewhere. Um, we found that uh, the big three, so Ford, General Motors, and Fiat Chrysler are probably best positioned to comply with the new rules. That's largely based on their longevity in the U.S. market and the fact that they had just have established supply chains here. Um, along with the big three, the longstanding uh, Japanese entrants in the U.S. market, Honda and Toyota, are, should also be relatively well positioned to deal with the new rules. I just stress again that it matters vehicle to vehicle, part to part. Um, the most recent foreign investors in North America that do a lot of production in Mexico in particular, like Volvo, Mazda, Hyundai, and BMW will have a more difficult time meeting the requirements. Um, and that's just based on how uh, short of a time they've been in the market and also where some of their production is set up. So um, rough, uh, the administration also does expect that the, transi the transition periods in USMCA will provide uh, stakeholders enough time to adapt their supply chains. but. It's still, regardless of the transition, the adaptation period still requires expenses and, and could require changes to supply chains. And it's important to keep in mind that if you need to source a part from elsewhere or, you know, those decisions aren't made overnight and they can't happen at a flip of a switch. You're dealing with tens of thousands of components per vehicle. Each component likely has to meet a specific quality and safety standard. And the work that goes into to making those decisions, and then you know, let's say you have to make that decision a hundred times if over the, to to make your car uh, or to make your part meet the rule of origin. That that's a lot of cost and a lot of time. Um, so multiple outcomes could arise um, from added costs from the new rules of origin, depending on on which parts of the supply chain shoulder them. So again, it's important to keep in mind that you know the supply chain doesn't start and end with the vehicle assemblers. It goes from the folks who put the vehicles together down to the, the, the folks who, you know, get the, make the iron and the steel, right? Um, so another thing we found is that the auto industry is uh, largely still working through 
how the rules will affect their individual companies, and I won't speak for them. Um, but, um, you know, there is an expectation that overall the rules in the long term will generate investment, additional investment in the United States, uh, just in terms of, of in order to meet the compliance and, and uh, get preferential trade treatment. Um, so steel and aluminum producers uh, in particular will likely see gains from the rules that uh, goes back to the tariff shift um, provisions that I was speaking to earlier. Um, the labor value content rule combined with a higher regional value content um, for core parts, so that's like your engine, your transmission, your chassis, and advanced, ba uh, advanced batteries for electric vehicles. The combination of those two rules should also spur long-term investment in the United States. So, uh, for example, if, if your engine or your advanced battery is built in, in Mexico, uh, where wages are relatively lower than those in the US, your vehicle is going to have a really hard time meeting the, the labor value rule um, because the core component, the engine and the advanced battery, make up such a large percentage of the vehicle's overall uh, content. There's an argument that increased core parts production in the US and uh, Canada would pull parts production of, of smaller parts along with it, um, just for logistical reasons. Uh, that argument, I, there are arguments to be made on both sides, um, for sure. Um, and then, you know, the other thing to keep in mind is that all of these changes have implications for the workforce. So the auto industry alone supported over employs directly around 2 million U.S. workers. The steel and aluminum industries employ roughly 300,000 workers in the U.S. Counting indirect jobs, you know, the auto industry supports over 7 million workers in the U.S. But it, it's important to keep in mind that more production in the U.S. doesn't necessarily mean more jobs, right? Because as there's a general trend towards automation and you can find unrealized gains in efficiency, uh, those two things aren't necessarily um, analogous. Um, so I mean, at the end of the day, it all raises the question of if there are additional costs, which there are likely to be in the short term, um, you know, how does that play out for the consumer and how does that play out for the companies and what does that mean? So the question is who shoulders the cost in, in the supply chain? It's kind of impossible to know exactly how that will play out. So in the report, we presented a menu of potential outcomes really broadly, I mean, vehicle prices could rise, consumers could be offered fewer options in their vehicles to keep prices stable. Um, manufacturers could require that suppliers trim already narrow margins to keep prices stable. Um, costs or sales, added costs or lower sales um, could reduce companies' spare capital when they need to invest in new technologies. Um, and, and, there, and there are a slew, a slew of other uh, of outcomes a, as well. But the key question really will be, how does the industry adapt um, and price in the changes um, that are required? There are upsides. Obviously, I mentioned the steel and aluminum industry. There is a spare capacity in the US parts industry right now that could be ramped up to meet um, needs, uh, new needs. Obviously, a constraint um, is, is skilled labor. That's something that we heard over and over again um, to, to scale up that capacity. And as, as I mentioned, over the long term, there is an expectation that the new rules will generate investment in the North American auto industry. Um, so what does it all mean um, for rules of origin outside of the USMCA automotive context? Because this was a case study. So um, we had a couple takeaways. Uh, first, there's a, a danger of rules being too complex and too restrictive, right? This is a situation where you kind of want to find the sweet spot where companies have the freedom to construct economically efficient supply chains um, while the rules still incentivize production within the free trade uh, area. There, are, uh, there have been other studies done about um, the effect that complex rules of origin or rules of origin in general have on um, use of preferential trade. So a 2011 WTO report found that 16% of global goods trade, exclu excluding intra-EU trade, qualified for preferential tariff rates, and part of the reason that number is so low is just companies found compliance with rules of origin to be too cumbersome. A uh, study done by East Asia and Latin America, or uh, a study of firms done in East Asia and Latin America in uh, late 2007, 2008, also found that costs to comply with rules of origin deterred firms from using them. In the USMCA, 
context, uh, the worst case scenario would be for companies to decide that the cost of meeting the new rules would be greater than the cost of paying the 2.5% US most favored nation tariff. Um, that is not an outcome that we think is uh, likely or heard a lot of folks say would be something that they're uh, considering. But, you know, as folks continue to price in the impact that the rules of origin have uh, on their supply chains, it is important to keep in mind that the US MFN tariff for vehicles is relatively low. And, um, you know, that, that scenario kind of it represents the ultimate risk of crafting rules of origin that are too complicated. The second takeaway we had is that uh, small changes in rules of origin can have really large impacts, right? So this is particularly true in a complex and layered industry like the automotive industry. Deciding if you, uh, that you need to change where one part is sourced uh, could mean layoffs in one part of the country or in one country and additional jobs in another country. If you make that decision a hundred of, uh, hundreds of times, obviously the impact is magnified. Uh, third is that um, complicated rules of origin also present difficulties for small and medium-sized enterprises. This is something that we heard a lot as well. So if, if you're kind of just making a really niche part uh, or filling a niche gap in a supply chain uh, and you employ not that many folks, um, your firm just might lack the knowledge or understanding of rules of origin, you might have an absence of expertise to ensure compliance. And that can lead to unintended or unexpected costs, um, lead to additional administrative expenses, and so on. Um, and fourth and lastly, as Bill mentioned, as supply chains become more complex and rules of or, uh, and, and regional and plurilateral trade agreements continue to proliferate, uh, you're, you're likely to see more innovative rules of origin, right? So USMCA and the labor rule is one example of this, but as uh, the global economy shifts, uh, towards global value chains and away from just physical supply chains making up the bulk of commerce, uh, I think you're likely to see uh, continued innovation in this space, certainly not going away. Um, so with that, I'll invite the rest of the panelists up. Um, and, if, and we can have a discussion. Far seat, and you guys are the, take the middle ones, and I'll take the one at the end. Well, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that, Jack. And for all of you out there, just a reminder: uh, now is a good time to start thinking of questions if you have any. <laughs> and uh, at, in a, we'll wait a few minutes, and then uh, Jonas and. Madeline will come around and, and uh, collect them, and when you see them, just raise your hand and or raise your card, and we'll give them to you. Uh, I'm really happy that we've been able to put together a panel of, of uh, such expertise uh, to comment on the paper and to and some of the issues that uh, surround the industry right now. And I want to introduce them uh, to you, and then we'll go right into some uh, conversation of our own. Uh, to my immediate left is. Uh, uh, governor Matt Blunt, who was Governor of Missouri from 2005 to 2009. Uh, he's currently the president of the American Automotive Policy Council, uh, which represents the interests of the big three, Fiat Chrysler, Ford, and GM. Prior to being governor, he served as a Missouri State Representative and Missouri Secretary of State. He started his career in the Navy, serving for 14 years on active duty and in the reserves. Uh, he graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy with a degree in history, and I learned earlier he's also a cattle farmer, <laughs> as is my father-in-law. So, uh, Next to him is uh, Lila Afas, who is the Director of International Public Policy at Toyota Motor North America. Uh, she worked for USTDA, the Trade and Development Agency, previously as a Director of Export Promotion and Country Manager for the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, she also has worked as manager of Grant Thornton's public, uh, global public sector practice uh, and as an international trade advisor at WEF, the World Economic Forum, and as associate at U.S. Trust. Uh, her degrees are from uh, Columbia and an undergraduate degree from James Madison. Next, and, uh, uh, next to Jack is uh, Phil Sherman, who is the international trade manager at Daimler North America where he represents interests including those of Mercedes-Benz 
and Daimler trucks and buses. Prior to that, he was counsel to the Congressional Intergovernmental Affairs Department at the Canadian Embassy here in Washington, so maybe he's going to uh, prevail on him to prevent, can present a Canadian perspective as well. Um, that makes him kind of a, a, a twofer. Um, he was a research assess assistant in the U.S. Senate and a content specialist in legislative and executive sources at LexisNexis. Uh, he has a law degree uh, from uh, the David Clark School of Law at the University of District of Columbia and a BA from Maryland. And you know Jack, we just did that. So let me start by asking them uh, first the most obvious question of all, which is simply, can you make a couple comments on the report? Uh, is it, did we get it right? Did we get it wrong? Particularly, did we get it wrong? Tell us where we got it wrong. Um, does it uh, provide any useful guidance? Matt, sure, you go first? I, I think it was, uh, it's an excellent report. I thought uh, as somebody that likes to really understand the history of issues, to understand the issue. I thought it did a, a really wonderful job, and I encourage people to read those pages, uh, explaining the history behind uh, U.S.-Canada automotive trade and then the incorporation of Mexico. Uh, I think it'll help you understand how we ended up with perhaps the NAFTA rule of origin, which is very stringent, and then, of course, now the USMCA rule of origin. So I thought that was a great uh, point. I think it's made a number of good findings. I mean, I think we do have a validation of the fact that um, you can use rule of origin um, to achieve national and regional economic goals. I think when this process started, a lot of us argued that that wasn't the purpose of rules of origin. Rules of origin were designed to ensure you didn't have a free rider problem. Uh, and I think the administration has actually demonstrated otherwise. I do think the report probably understates um, the economic impact of the new rule of origin and the investment that will be required to, to reach it. I think it probably overestimates um, the number of models that meet the USMCA rule of origin today. I would, I would argue there's probably just a very few models that meet the USMCA rule of origin um, today. Uh, there are probably some companies that don't have any models that meet it, and a, a few companies that, that have uh, more, than, more than a handful. Um, but I think companies will have to make significant investments to meet the USMCA rule of origin. And our, our three member companies, um, as a report cited, uh, are you know, heavily, have a heavy history in the United States, are heavily footprinted in the United States. And in recent weeks, they've announced $4 billion worth of investment. And all three companies have cited the USMCA rule of origin is a, is a, is a important reason uh, to justify uh, that uh, investment. So I think you'll see a lot of investment in the United States and that it will have uh, a big impact. Oh. Great. Well, I mean, personally, I thought finally there's a way to explain rules of origin because that <laughs> is probably the number one question I get from uh, people throughout our company or what are these rules? And quite frankly, when it comes to free trade agreements, they're about two things. <laughs> they're about market access and they're about rules. <clears throat> and so I think your report made three really compelling points. And the first is that those rules need to be set correctly and artfully crafted because if they're too low, then companies can benefit by duty-free access throughout the region without really investing in the markets that are part of that agreement. But if they're too high, then companies will bypass that and just uh, sort of export into the market directly and pay whatever, whatever the tariff may be. Um, secondly, I think it did a great job of explaining why predictable rules are so important and how NAFTA, which provided that predictability, really led to tremendous growth in the U.S. auto industry and, and transformed it into a global exporting hub. I mean, honestly, Toyota really grew up under NAFTA. We have a 60-year history in the United States, but the year before NAFTA became law in 1994, we had two plants in the United States. And since then, we've built eight more for a total of 10 plants across America. And today, there are over 170,000 Americans who earn their living working for Toyota. And that's something we're very proud of, as we are our also recent investment announcement um, of $750 million to sort of even modernize even more the plants that we have. And I think the last point that they made is um, this, this importance of these rules, as, as important as they are, rather, <laughs> they aren't the only thing that we look at 
when you make investment decisions. There's so many other factors at play. Looking at what is the you know, skill of the workforce, what are the uh, resources, the natural resources, what is the infrastructure like, how is their ability to get goods in and out, intellectual property protections, access to sophisticated capital markets. I mean, these are multi-year investments that we're making. I mean, the life cycle of a plant is about 20 to 30 years. And so right now, our industry really needs that predictability, which is why we also encourage the passage of USMCA so that you know, we can continue our American journey beyond these past 60 years and, and have much more success in this market. Phil? So I want to thank CSIS and Alcoa for putting this together. I think the report hits a lot of the major subjects, including the RVC, the metals, and the LVC. One of the things I think that we want to focus on a little bit is OEMs are long-term investors. You're going to hear two words, certainty and predictability. And so what these agreements allow for is us to safeguard our investments. I think one of the things we also should highlight more in terms of the supplier base is the role of tech companies as new suppliers and where they factor in in the supplier question. I think the $64,000 question that the report doesn't touch, and because none of us know the answer to, is what happens next, the ratification process. But in terms of the content of covering the, the rules in Chapter 4, you guys did a great job, so thank you for that. Let me pick up on something that uh, the uh, point that uh, Matt Blunt made, and, and then maybe get ask the three of you to come in. I won't ask Jack, Jack whether he thinks it's a good report or not, uh, <laughs> but um, occasionally I think you get, you get some hints of people that haven't thought about this a lot, saying, "Well, you know, changing, altering your supply chain is not that complicated. You know, you just get rid of that supplier and you sign up this one, and that's, you know, that's a contractual issue. End of the story." Talk a little bit about the, the complexity of this, how long it takes uh, to make changes like this and how difficult it is. I remember uh, uh, Lila, in a, in a uh, round table we did to get prepare for this uh, a couple of months ago, you talked about the process of qualifying new suppliers. Maybe each of you can say a couple of words about the complexity of the process and what the companies are going to have to go through in order to accommodate the new rules. Who wants to go first? So I'll take you it first. first. Yeah. So it's about a four to five year timeline to go from the drawing room to the showroom. And so within that, that takes a lot of planning. So if you think about it, I mean, the, the um, cars that our designers are developing now, they need to know what rules they need to make when they're rolling off the line. And so within that, we have to consider our supply chain. And I think the report points out that the average vehicle has about 30,000 different parts. But what folks might not realize is each automaker, about 70% of our cost structure is our suppliers. Mm -hmm. And so, and they are, account for honestly more than half of our innovation. And so it's also their ability to, to meet these rules and their ability to comply. And I mean, to your point about uh, the time that it takes, you know, if you're, if I was a dressmaker in Utah, right, and I and import my cloth from China and all of a sudden there's a tariff on that cloth, I can easily switch and start importing fabric from Vietnam or Indonesia or Thailand or some other country. We don't have that ability in the auto industry because it is a lengthy process to find suppliers that can meet sort of our detailed specifications, but also to do the quality, safety, security checks. So it takes several years to get to that point. So there's, as Jack said, there's no flipping a switch to switch suppliers. I mean, it, you have to build that timeline into the process. Sure, I'd be happy to, to comment. I mean, yeah, I think if you, if you step back and look at the rule of origin, um, the NAFTA rule of origin was, and since it's still in effect is, the most stringent rule of origin in the auto sector of any free trade agreement anywhere in the world. And as you can see from the, the presentation, the USMCA rule of origin is now by far the most complex, stringent uh, requirement that exists in any free trade agreement in the world. And it really will force manufacturers to think more about the rule of origin and their sourcing decisions than they've ever done before. And when you talk to customs teams at our member companies, you'll, you'll get that sort of report. It is, really is going to be a challenge. You're going to have to constantly think about uh, rule of origin compliance. I think they even think through how they're going to walk through. So they're going to start, I think, in most cases with the core parts and seeing if they get to the 75% on their mm -hmm. core parts. And that is a process not only having a qualified supplier, but then getting the information from that supplier, whether it's a certificate or an email that reports 
and provides the documentation to explain that that supplier met the requirement or what percentage of their content would be considered uh, USMCA content. And that really is going to require just almost a constant beating up's the wrong word, but in some days probably seems like the right word uh, of suppliers to get that, that information. And of course, tier one suppliers are going to have to do that with tier two suppliers and tier three suppliers. And as you get small, further and further down, you get into smaller and smaller firms, and it can become more and more challenging to get the documentation. So that's just one part of this rule is those is those uh, the threshold for those most important parts. Then they say they're going to work through the, the appendix B and annex excuse me annex B and C parts. And then once they've done that, determine if they've hit 75 percent. But of course, they don't build to 75 percent because everybody wants wiggle room. If you don't get the documents, or if you get bad documents, or if a supplier goes bankrupt or something of that nature, so you really are going to build in three or four points, maybe even five points above 75 percent. And then you're going to go on to your next step, which is going to be just the labor value content, and that's asking all those suppliers if they pay a non-fringe wage of $16 an hour, and then determining if you get to the 40 or 45% threshold, depending on the, the product. And of course, you can count some of your research and development and some high, high wage assembly uh, in that. And then finally, actually probably the easiest step then for at least our members will be just to demonstrate that 70% of the steel and aluminum you consume uh, as a company was purchased from, from North America. But that's a big process, and it's going to have to occur on every single model. And it is going to be demanding and challenging. It's something our member companies think we can live with. That's why we've endorsed strongly the USMCA, and we're pushing Congress and encouraging Congress to uh, pass the implementing legislation. But this is going to be a, it's a big process uh, for, for companies, and nobody should underestimate uh, how it's going to change the supply chain and change some of the sourcing decisions. So we're looking at what new costs are going to come from USMCA, and we're looking at compliance and administrative costs. They're going to be significant. We're working through them. But as we said, one of the challenges are now we have three categories of parts. We have core parts, principal parts, and complementary parts, each with their own RBC level. So what does this do for suppliers and OEMs? A lot of major OEMs and major suppliers use a uh, global trade management system. If we get, get rid of the standard certificate, what is going to happen now? Everyone, it, it's going to be a really heavy lift there to just to get the compliance where it needs to be, where it's not such a burden on the overall value of the vehicle. So following up that up, are the transition periods adequate in here or not? Our, our members believe they're adequate. Yeah, I mean, our philosophy is to um, build where we sell and to buy where we build. So it, because of that and the fact that we produce our transmissions and engines here in the United States, I mean, we have the ability to meet those requirements. So some companies are better positioned to meet the requirements on day one or within the three-year period. Fortunately, there is language in the agreement that allows OEMs to secure an additional two years. And that's called an alternative staging regime. So there is some flexibility there, assuming you meet the requirements of a credible and detailed plan to actually get those two years to come on board with the new requirements. Well, one of the things that we that uh, Jack talked about when he presented was that the articulated purpose of, of all this uh, has been to bring back production or maximize production and manufacturing inside the United States. That was the point uh, that Ambassador Lighthizer has been clear about and the President has been clear about. At the same time, uh, and I think our, our study concluded that it, 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 to a certain extent it's going to have that effect. Uh, at the same time, uh, data seems to suggest, uh, at least for the short term, declining demand uh, for new vehicles in the United States. So that leads to the question, is that the right goal? Uh, is, that, you know, is the right policy for the United States to be pursuing to focus on domestic production and you know, increasing the domestic market? Or is, would it have been better to focus on global competitiveness and the global market? All of your companies, uh, including the, the, the U.S. companies, are heavily invested and heavily active elsewhere. Uh, and is that where the growth is, or do you see the growth primarily in the United States? So I would, I would say, you know, the answer to your question is that 
is obviously that the other markets, other markets is where a lot of the growth is going to be globally. Uh, but the United States still matters. We're still the largest uh, uh, market in the world by value, not by volume, but by value today. And everybody wants to compete here. So people are going to invest here in order to have access to um, the North American marketplace and the U.S. marketplace. But there's no question that uh, most of the growth in the global automobile uh, marketplace is going to be in other markets. And that's why you know, we, we do work with the administration on, on ways to open other markets to vehicles that are built to federal motor vehicle standards uh, to ensure that we're adequately and aggressively addressing uh, technical barriers to trade. We think that the USMCA has a lot of a couple of provisions that need to be in all free trade agreements, which is to address uh, the potential for currency manipulation, which the USMCA does, and then also um, to ensure that uh, you know, markets agree to continue to accept products built to federal motor vehicle safety standards, which is one of our big challenges globally in ensuring we have access to, to other markets is, is regulatory acceptance of our products. So we think the USMCA actually sets a couple of good precedents for the future on ways that you really ought to, you know, tools you ought to use to open markets around the world. You know, um, Jay Timmons, who's the head of the National Association of Manufacturers, recently did his, his state of manufacturing. And he said there are over 400,000 manufacturing jobs currently in the United States that we can't fill. And so there's already hundreds of thousand jobs. And, and the issue is training workers that they can fill these jobs. And that's why sort of a, a big commitment by Toyota is to train these workers through apprenticeship programs and for, through workforce development. And if the goal is, to create more jobs and, and to create more opportunities. Let's fill the jobs that we already have open and let's train them for the jobs of the future. And working hand in hand with universities and technical training and vocational schools in order to make sure people are equipped to have these really high paying, high quality jobs that are available in our industry, which I think a lot of folks don't realize um, how, how beautiful uh, these plants are. I mean, my goodness, you tour them. It's, it's unbelievable. And I think that whole image that uh, folks have of, of a dirty you know, auto plant or, or factory workers, it, that's not what it's like at all. And I think that there's uh, been a huge push to really encourage uh, people to look at this line of work and, and how, uh, you know, sort of how fulfilling it is and, and also the ability to make tremendous products. This creates the opportunity for commercial. Uh, our, the, 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 next, the next report we're going to release uh, next month is on worker training for advanced manufacturing. Uh, it grows out of some work we did last year on additive manufacturing. Uh, and one of the companies that is in that business approached us and said they are having difficulty getting qualified workers. And can we look and figure out what that problem is and how to deal with it? So come back and see us in a month or so, and we'll have a, a study on that. Uh, uh, Lila, let me ask you, this is probably an unfair question, but uh, the governor mentioned uh, the currency manipulation provision. Do you guys have a view on that? That is a view for the governments to discuss. And so, and also I think finance ministries and, and being able to determine how capital markets are managed and the flows go. Yeah, it's an unfair question. Gover companies don't <laughs> manipulate currency. Governments do. But uh, your, your government probably has a view on it. But, uh, My government is the U.S. government, though. <laughs> ah. All right. Touche. Uh, Phil, you want to add anything? I do not. <laughs> <laughs> not on that one, no. Uh, in terms of the uh, competitiveness question, we are a globally active company, and we welcome trade agreements that reduce trade barriers and promote free and fair trade. You're looking at um, investment and free trade are key factors in innovation, prosperity, growth. And what we get out of these agreements is certainty as, as to whether or not the U.S. marketplace is a, is a growth market. For us, it is the number one market for Daimler trucks, it's the number one market for Daimler financial services, it's the number two market for Mercedes-Benz cars. We employ over 26,000 people in the U.S. It is a major market for us. We are committed to this market. In terms of global competitiveness, we uh, build three uh, SUVs in Alabama that are uh, exclusively built there, and they are globally exported. And what we want to make sure is that this, this agreement allows these vehicles to maintain their competitiveness on the global markets. OK. If I could make one, yeah, just please, one more please. comment on that. I, you know, it, to emphasize how the, the real opportunity is to grow exports. 
which I think all many of us would, would agree with, uh, the United States today exports about 20% of our automotive production. Uh, Korea, Japan, Germany all export more than 50% of their automotive production. So even if we were to go from 20% to 30% in, in, in terms of percentage of our uh, product that we were exporting, it'd have a dramatic impact on uh, employment and investment in the automotive industry. Is that, okay, this is, <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot, but is, is that, is that part of the planning for the companies? Is that the goal? Or is the goal to establish manufacturing centers in third countries like China and build those out and meet those markets that way? Sure, it depends on, it depends on the market. I mean, China's been a market where um, the companies have invested heavily in manufacturing in China, but at the same time, China's really has historically been one of our largest export markets. Well, you're doing there exactly what Toyota did here, really, and that is you but that takes, takes a certain scale in the marketplace. Um, so some of the smaller markets that are emerging, I think you'll see <coughs> lots of U.S. product exported to those markets. And that's an important issue, is the scale issue, is that we produce seven models here in the United States, and we export to 32 countries from the United States. And, you know, making sure that your vehicles are cost competitive in those third-party markets, but also you, you're not always able to manufacture in those other markets because there's not a huge demand for the Corolla or the Camry. So it's the scale issue. And so being able to export it from the United States where we have that scale to develop at that level and have these, those, again, those, those economic efficiencies and then export it to these other countries where we couldn't justify building a plant to manufacture 20,000 vehicles a year. I absolutely agree. Got some great questions, but <laughs> <coughs> I've got a couple. <laughs> You're not going to like them. Uh, I, mean, I mean, that's not you particularly, not but here. not personally. Yeah. All three of them. <laughs> yeah. But let me. I've got a couple more first, and then we'll move to, to the, uh, the we we'll like. move to the we'll move to the Probably ones you don't not. like. Uh, Take your time. One, <laughs> one of the things that uh, the Jack alluded to in the presentation, and which the report mentions, is that all this is happening when there's a lot of other things going on. Uh, the, the, in the, the industry is rapidly uh, dealing with uh, electric vehicles or alternative fuel vehicles, to be even uh, more broad than that, uh, and is also uh, is you know uh, <clears throat> is also dealing with autonomous uh, driving, which is going to put uh, I think a significant new component of software of, of, of nothing else and, and source code into vehicles and make that a much more a higher percentage of the value. How, do, how does all that that's going on intersect, well, let me back, do it in reverse. How do the new rules of origin intersect with all those things going on? I assume it makes your life much more complicated, but is there anything more to it than just that statement? Well, I think it, it does. I think, you know, one, USMCA tries, I think, to take some of that into account. The credit you get for research and development in the rule of origin is that's a unique, um, a unique provision of, of NAFTA, so I think it recognizes that the research and development behind sort of the AV revolution is important, and it encourages a lot of that work to, to be done here as it is as it is uh, as it is today. Uh, the battery provision in USMCA, I think, also reflects a desire to ensure that we build out a more robust battery assembly industry in the United States. So I think the agreement tries to take some of this that change into account, but clearly you're at a period of dramatic change in the auto industry, and uh, this new massive change and administrative requirement uh, that you're adding on to the supply chain um, is just going to add to that complexity. No, I mean, absolutely. I mean, we're at a, we're just like a revolution in the automotive industry right now. And so we, we do have to take that as another layer in the multi-dimensional way that we view our investments and our production decisions and everything that we're doing. And so, and, and it's, a, it's a fierce race, I have to tell you. I mean, as you mentioned earlier, um, technology companies are our suppliers, but they're also our competitors. And so there's a lot of uh, new entrants to the market and how we manage that and, and roll forward to the future. And I think that's why you see this tremendous um, effort towards R&D. And, you know, Toyota really put its uh, R&D headquarters in the United States. A couple of years ago, we built the Toyota Research Institute, a billion dollar investment with three campuses across America. But over the past, you know, 10 years, Toyota's had over 14,000 patents in the United States yeah. alone. So, I mean, just the scale of the research and development and we're doing just to stay on that cutting edge. So the agreement definitely is looking to 
establish or, excuse me, mature the advanced technology market in the US, you see that by the inclusion of advanced batteries in the core parts list. You're going from 62 and a half to 75 and you put that part right there in the core parts list. That is designed to increase investment and technology in the US. In terms of advanced batteries, we have made that investment. We have seen that future. We saw it before USMC ever started. We are investing in a battery plant in Alabama. We put a billion dollars down there. It's going to be part of our global logistics center. Mm -hmm. And that's really as we're coming online with the next gen technologies, we're seeking to incorporate those in, into our vehicles. And what you're going to see by that local investment is the development of the local supplier base. And that will benefit those as well. OK. I have some more, but these are so interesting. The, <laughs> we're going to go to the audience questions. Uh, the first one, I think, is really for Phil more than anybody else. Are the rules of origin in USMCA a precedent for the EU-US trade talks? No, I, 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 I haven't heard. Are you asking me if, the, uh, if there's oh, any okay. nexus between the RVC here and USEU and whether or not they're going to ask for similar terms? That's, say that again? Are you asking if they're going to ask for similar terms in USEU yeah. that they asked for in USMCA? Well, let's, let's have those talks begin first, and, and then we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> they just have to argue about agriculture first, apparently. All right, this is an interesting one that had not occurred to me, and I don't think we address it in our, the study. Um, with the U.S. withdrawal from the Paris Accords uh, and the freezing of emission standards in automobiles, how do the new rules of origin in USMCA impact production, given that Canada and Mexico will remain part of the Paris Accords? I don't personally think I'm qualified to answer that question. Uh, I mean, I, I hate to kind of throw that out there, but. I mean, I've uh, never if, heard anybody in industry yeah. indicate that that was going to be an issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, yeah. those are, I mean, I think regulatory issues. I mean, to see how things pan out. But also, there, there's sort of many companies, including Toyota, we have a commitment, a 2050 environmental challenge that, regardless of sort of rules or regulations. It's like a global commitment that we've made and we aim to meet and we are on track to meet, so. This is an interesting question. Uh, and um, you're not all lawyers, so I. <laughs> so not even, even close. <laughs> that, but could the new rules of origin uh, be considered as performance requirements, which are prohibited by investment and trade agreements? We have another question related to that, which is, uh, is the wage clause, the wage requirement, consistent with WTO rules? Has there been any discussion about that? Uh, I've heard discussion of it, but I've not heard any sort of definitive yeah. judgment. And, and it'll be seen, especially if Mexico codifies it through their labor reform. I mean, there's, there's other vehicles there and, that are, could be affiliated with that, but. Will the way, okay. Um, Another question related specifically to the wage clause, which is, I, th I think I know the answer, but uh, I'll leave it to you. Is it good for U.S. workers? Yeah, well, I mean, I would argue it will. It will. It will force sourcing of components that are paid at that wage, which will probably lead to more U.S. workers doing this. Won't necessarily lead to an increase in U.S. wages. I wouldn't think. Would you? by itself, because it's, it's at a level where we're already there. In terms of, certainly most assembly jobs would already be there. There's probably some, some parts industry jobs that we'll have to adjust. Oh, OK. In the US. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. I would just or note, shift so, from other markets to the US. Yeah, Jeff? I'd, I'd just note on the wages, it's important to remember that 16 an hour is uh, like the ceiling. Like That's all that you have to meet. And there's no built in, You know, it doesn't go up every year. Um, so whether or not so that's good, floor. Yeah. yeah. So whether or not that's, that's good long term yeah. for U.S. wages is, I think, to be determined, right? Because companies might not be incentivized to go over sixteen dollars an hour, sixteen dollars now versus sixteen dollars in a decade with inflation uh, could be different. Mm -hmm. There's a couple questions here that relate to Congress. Uh, and sort of what will they do and what has their reaction been uh, about uh, the agreement and its prospects. And so um, 
you're not members of Congress. Uh, you have a relative that is, but uh, <laughs> that, do that doesn't count. Uh, what have you picked up in your conversation? I mean, you both, uh, I think all three of you have indicated, at least two of you have indicated, you support the agreement, and therefore you presumably support Congress uh, approving the agreement. So I assume you're having some conversations up there about this. Uh, in, what comes up when, on the, in, in, your, in your corner of the world? I mean, there's discussions about other pieces, uh, labor and environment generally. There's discussions about pharmaceuticals. What conversations do you have about uh, the auto provisions when you talk to people in Congress? Or is it just nothing? You know? Sure, well, I think uh, you know, we do talk to lots of uh, uh, members. And um, you know, I, think, uh, I think lots of members are, are studying it closely. And um, certainly some that are historically for tree, free trade agreements have already in, endorsed the USMCA. But I think uh, there are lots of folks that are really taking a look at it, trying to understand all the provisions. I think a good sign is that not very many people have come out fully against it. They're asking questions. They're talking about specific areas that they'd like to see addressed in the implementing bill or through some other mechanism. I think that's a really um, good sign. And, uh, all indications I have are that Speaker Pelosi's office and the administration have very constructive discussions underway right now about um, the agreement and the implementing uh, bill. Uh, so I think there's there's lots of um, lots of things to be positive about. Uh, certainly, you, know, there, you wouldn't be surprised by a list of things what people want to talk about. Certainly, the labor provisions and uh, Mexico's. Uh, delay, but hopefully soon to be uh, implementation of those labor provisions. I think is a is a big uh, is a hurdle that some people need to get across. And, and USMCA doesn't just need to be ratified by our Congress. It also has to be passed in uh, Canada and Mexico. And I think in Canada, you have a tight political calendar because of their elections this October and the fact that they'll be adjourning uh, in a couple months for the summer. And then also in Mexico, uh, you also have some pressures. But I think both Mexico City and Ottawa really want to see the steel and aluminum tariffs lifted before they move forward with the USMCA, and that's a sentiment echoed by many in the US industry, as well as members of Congress. And so I think that's gonna be a major obstacle to moving forward with USMCA, and we hope that it's resolved very quickly because we, we do want to see USMCA passed. Well, that, yeah, that gets to a couple other questions, which is I assume in your conversations with the Hill, at least based on public reports, the steel and, auto, the steel and aluminum tariffs on Mexico and Canada come up. Uh, periodically, and you've responded to one of the questions, which is why would Canada and Mexico approve this when those are still in existence? Uh, what is your sense of what the Congress will do on this? Will they insist that they go away before they'll vote on them, uh, or do you think they're going to survive uh, the debate on the agreement? Yeah, I think there's a, a general consensus that the uh, tariffs uh, imposed now against Canada and Mexico will be removed as a part of the as part of the agreement. passage of the implementing bill. You guys agree with that? That's the hope. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that's the hope. That's, not the, that's his expectation. It's your hope. Phil, yeah. where are you on that? I, I mean, you know, it's like reading tea leaves, but you, you see Chairman Grassley, I mean, when the chairman of Senate Finance says, you know, these got to go if you want to ratify. I mean, you know, it's a pretty influential voice. And, you know, it, it, and it, it, we don't want to see uh, tariffs replaced with quotas. I mean, I think that's what we want. We already have a North American agreement. We already have a steel and aluminum requirement within the rules of origin. I mean, we don't need any other sort of friction within that trade. So comment then on, uh, uh, let's assume for the moment we solve the steel and aluminum tariff problem. Uh, there's another one looming out there, which is the automobile tariff issue, which the president resurrected again today, although apparently with a year reprieve, which itself is kind of an interesting question, because if he's going to tell the Mexicans, you've got a year to do various things, mostly related to drug traffic, I think was today's uh, comment. Does that imply that everybody else has a year? Uh, that he's not going to do anything to anybody on auto tariffs? Or is that specific for Mexico? But talk a little bit about the, uh, you know, put all this in the context of the looming auto tariffs. If those are actually imposed, uh, what is that going to do to your industry? And how, how is that going to complicate uh, two things, both complying with the rules of origin but also congressional uh, congressional passage of the of the uh, USMCA. So we believe that the imposition of uh, Section 232 tariffs on autos, the auto industry, would be extremely harmful, and not just to the auto industry, but to the entire economy. We certainly make that 
case on a, on a regular uh, basis. Um, if they were to be imposed, it makes the USMCA I think even more important, given the uh, the safeguards that exist because of the the side letters and side agreement on uh, on uh, 232 uh, tariffs with Canada and Mexico. Um, so it would certainly I don't think it would it would just make USMCA that much more important. It'll frustrate a lot of people I think on the Hill, which will be something that the administration will have to take into account as they seek their support on USMCA. Yes, I mean the the, the economic analysis of potential uh, 232 tariffs are just cataclysmic for the U.S. economy. I mean, they talk about losing over 2 million auto-related jobs. We just talked about the over 7 million Americans who earn their living working for our industry. The uh, increase in the cost of a car at a time when we already see the market demand softening. I mean, this is a threat at this time we just can't d contend with. I mean, there, there's so many other things that we should be focusing on. Let's focus on that workforce training to get more Americans in jobs. Let's focus on ways to improve our infrastructure. Let's, let's focus on all these ways that we can build uh, a more robust industry, not just for us, but that can spill over across the entire economy. And let's not do something that's going to cause such harm and will surely invite retaliation by our trading partners. And you know, my family is uh, our farmers in Minnesota and Wisconsin, and they're dairy farmers. So they're getting hit hard by the retaliatory tariffs by uh, China and by uh, Canada and Mexico even. And so this is a real, I mean, firsthand challenge. Um, and so we do not want to see them punished any further. And so I think that is really, you know, another thing that many members of Congress and industry, even outside our sector, have been united about and have been really vocalizing strongly that we cannot go down this road and we need to take the threat of auto tariffs just completely off the table. Yeah, so it's important to note that all of us on this panel right here are aligned on the 232 question. Mm -hmm. International and domestics, nobody is asking for this. Nobody's looking for it. There's a colleague of mine with another company. He says it best. You could have investments or tariffs. You can't have both. So it, it, it's, it's really hard to kind of go down this road. We, we opened this discussion talking about two words, predictability and certainty. If you're dropping tariffs into the equation, it just makes it that much more difficult to invest in the marketplace. Okay, here's one probably for Jack, put him on the spot for the moment. Okay. <laughs> uh, how exactly is the term origination in North America defined in terms of steel and aluminum. What are the implications of the 70% uh, requirement for those industries? Um, my understanding is that it has to be made in America, right? The steel, they're made in North America, the steel and aluminum, right? So extracted and put together, smelted, whatnot. Um, and the major uh, innovation, well, the major closing of the NAFTA loophole is, is the rule that you can't just import or source your steel and aluminum from anywhere, change it into a part, and have that part be originating, right? Um, the steel and aluminum itself has to come, uh, has to meet the, the NAFTA rule of origin. And I, I think on the steel and aluminum question, one thing that I actually would like to clarify, it's really important that people understand, it's 70% steel and 70% aluminum. There's no right. averaging there. And another thing I need to think about, too, is that, that part of the rule of origin in USMCA actually makes it totally unnecessary to impose these tariffs on Canada and Mexico. Michelle, do you want to comment? Okay. Uh, we're getting down to the, unless there's some more, Madeline, we're getting down to the end here. Um, how will the USMCA make sure that the participating countries meet all these thresholds? Have you had any conversations with the administration about that? In other words, this is, this is the speaker's question about enforcement, 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 enforcement. And I think she was talking about something else, but in this particular case, what are their enforcement plans? Do we know? I'm not sure that implementing legislation will be really key, and I think that's being crafted now, and we'll have to see how that is. But that is, of course, a huge issue, and, and they, they're something that they will focus on, given the concern. Has the, the Hill talked to any of you about that, 
about how to draft implementing legislation that will be, uh, you know, make your lives easier rather than harder? Nope. No? <laughs> well, they missed the boat then. You, no? No, no they're, they're, I mean, they know what they're doing. They know how they want to do it. And it's more of them telling us what they're doing. I mean, we obviously raise our position. We raise our concerns. I mean, we do our part to represent our interest. But in terms of what the final implementing legislation looks like, I mean, you're going to you know, wait and see what comes out. Well, here's an interesting question that, that um, for all of you, I think, new rules may increase domestic production, which is what we were talking about, but will it be for U.S. producers or will it be for foreign companies that are operating in the U.S.? We consider ourselves a U.S. producer. I mean, like I said, we've been in America for the past 60 years. We have 10 plants across the country. I mean, I think that our, you know, the 170,000 people who, again, earn their living working for our company consider themselves every bit as American as any worker working for one of your companies. I think our colleagues would agree with that, and so Absolutely. would your workers. So there really isn't this divide between this. We're all in the same industry, and we're all, just like when you made that little rejoinder about my government bill, you know, <laughs> um, is that we, that's how we look at it. We have uh, 23 major locations in 16 states. We, like I said earlier, we employ over 26,000 people. Our employees shop on Main Street. They are active in the community. We are. American company. Here's one that uh, I think um, Jack addressed, but I'd like you guys to address it as well. Uh, in the long run, what will be the impact of the new rules on the global competitiveness of cars built in the U.S., uh, especially as the industry evolves toward uh, towards autonomous vehicles? So I think, I mean, the U.S. today is really, I think, the market leader in terms of AV technology. Um, I think well over half the AV research and development and spend in the world is in the United States today. Um, and I think that'll continue to be, be the case. And we don't think there's anything in USMCA that undermines our global competitiveness. In fact, we think it's really important to maintain um, the sort of access we have to work with our Can Canadian and Mexican partners. And you know, there's really three big centers of automotive production in the world, um, North America, Europe, and Asia, and they've all got a similar mix of developed and developing economies and we need that same uh, we need our Mexican partners to be competitive with Europe and uh, and uh, Asia and the maintenance of USMCA will ensure that continues to be the case and that's an excellent point that governor raises I mean you're able to amortize the whole cost of your production with the low cost and the higher cost in order to spend more on that advanced R&D and manufacturing that you need so that we can maintain our role as the leader in innovation for mm -hmm. our industry and so that's why rules like export controls, which I don't want to go down that thorny path right now, Bill, but that's something that we need to uh, consider is that we're doing these things to sort of attract investment. And, and by the way, the U.S. is already the most attractive destination for foreign direct investment, but not repel it or not put any fear in it because of these, you know, these rules that could somehow inadvertently like sort of quarantine U.S. technology because companies can't risk that one ship of U.S. design can't be commercialized or exported or used in, in other technologies that they want to share with uh, the world. So we refer to them as case technologies, connected yeah. automated shared electric. And we've been investing in these for quite some time. And the nexus of this investment is going to be the next generation vehicle. And for Mercedes, that's the EQ class. And what we want to ensure is that as we have these vehicles that have all this advanced technology in them, they're more competitive in the global marketplace. Are the new rules better than the old ones? <laughs> <laughs> there are additional compliance costs. And, and we would argue that the new rules will, will force investment in the United States that wouldn't have occurred otherwise. And, and the current rules have been the law of the land for you know, the past 25 years, and so our supply chains have been built towards. All right, and, and as we said, the jump from 62 and a half to 75, plus the inclusion of the battery on the core parts, you're going to see uh, that, that investment. In the end, uh, we talked, we've talked about increased costs. One of the questions here, in the end, doesn't the consumer pay all these costs? And won't that be reflected in, in the price of automobiles? It, it, it's, you know, there's so many factors at play. It reminds me of when I was um, 
talking to someone from ExxonMobil, their chief economist a while ago, and asked, what's going to happen with gas prices? You know, and it's like, you, I can't answer that question. Because there's so many factors at play and so many dynamics. That's not just simply what OPEC sets the price at, or if there's an energy crisis, or if there's a, a, a travesty in Venezuela, who's a major exporter. I mean, it's the same. It's the same calculus. There's so many different things that go into it that it's hard to forecast. And as someone who's a, a trained economist, I'm really reticent to ever forecast. I like to say, um, you don't go to your doctor and ask, when am I going to get sick? You just ask, <laughs> what can I do to prevent getting sick? And so I like to stay on that side of it. But uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to say. But I can tell you that uh, a lot of suppliers are concerned about their ability just because they have narrower margins. They are smaller. It is, it is a challenge. And I mentioned earlier that you know, 70% of our spend um, is suppliers, but you know, 80% of that is, is in the US. So our suppliers are US based, and even that ability to meet, even though they're producing here in the United States, is an issue. Uh, this one, I think, let's start with Jack and then see if the rest of you want to comment. In addition to the top line changes, tightening the, the NAFTA, tightening the rules, to what degree are non regional inputs in intermediate parts also further restricted? Will there be less roll up of third country intermediate inputs within qualifying components in qualifying final vehicles? Uh, Save the well, simple one for the last. Yeah, yeah. You have some tough questions yeah, there. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> That's a complicated one. I think but just by the nature of raising the overall RVC for vehicles, you should, by definition, have less foreign parts being rolled up. Um, but just because the percentages are higher. Yeah, just yeah. because the percentages are higher, I think you'd have to have less. And you don't have tariff shift. Yeah. All right. Well, we've come just about to the end. Uh, let me thank the audience for good questions uh, and uh, for sticking with us. And let mm -hmm. me also ask you to thank the panel uh, for their wisdom as well. Uh, and that